Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Hi, it's Carol Santella. Welcome to the show. A couple of months ago, I was having lunch with one of my sisters, who for several years back I actually used to see almost daily. And so we got together, and I was hoping and being happy that we were going to see one, each other again. And it was actually now we maybe see each other every four or five weeks. Anyway, we sat down to lunch, and I was thinking how nice it was to finally get together so we could catch up and talk and laugh and connect. And, of course, what happened, she pulled out her cell phone and started checking her social sites. And I didn't say anything because she looked like she was enjoying herself. So I thought, well, okay, I'll let her go for a little while. But in the meantime, it happened to remind me of a Saturday not too long before that when a dear friend of mine and myself were out for a Saturday brunch. We found a really great little restaurant, and we absolutely didn't use our cell phones. We had a great time together. But when I was looking around that restaurant, I noticed something kind of interesting. It was a Saturday, as I said, and it seemed like a lot of fathers were out with their kids. So I was thinking, well, that's kind of nice because maybe it's dad time with the children, and, you know, mom get a chance to, you know, have some time to themselves. But the sad thing was when I looked around and some of the tables were small, fork in one hand, phone in the other, nobody looking eye contact, no conversation whatsoever. It was the scrolling, the texting, and connecting with that little handheld device and absolutely no communication with each other. So I was thinking to myself how what a wonderful opportunity that really would have been between that child and that father because both of my parents are gone now, and you know, we just don't realize how precious that time is. So the sad state of affairs is that's kind of the way things are in our world today. Well, anyway, did you ever have one of those times when you just know you connected with someone for a special reason or found solutions that perhaps you were seeking and had no idea where they were going to come from? Well, over the past week, I had the great pleasure of meeting Pete Hilke. He's a private chef from beautiful Melbourne, Australia, and the chef and host of the Australian Seafood Show on Foxtel TV. Well, shortly into the conversation, I asked Pete what was something dear to his heart that he'd want, or in this case, he'd want to have myself and you, our listeners, hear about and learn, and his answer was truly heartfelt. It hit home with me so much on multiple levels. One, because I love to cook, and I love the hospitality industry, and even more so because of my feelings about quality times with loved ones and education and stuff. Now, you have to keep in mind that Chef Pete had no idea what I had just mentioned right now. So he began talking about getting back to the basics in the kitchen by putting down the phones, connecting with family, having fun in the kitchen where there's no right or wrong, which I absolutely love that sense. And it was about learning and involvement and engagement with one's children as spouse or family. So, as I said, I loved that. I also learned quickly of his love for seafood in particular. And he helps moms and dads and kids to grow together in the kitchen through getting back to the basics of cooking with seafood, all the while laughing and learning from one another while doing so. And by the way, Chef Pete has also been featured as a private chef in the Australian Financial Review and has done interviews for Chef Radio in the UK. So with that, I am so truly honored to have with us Chef Pete himself today, and I welcome you wholeheartedly, dear Pete. How are you today? Carol, I am absolutely amazing, and what a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much. Oh, it's definitely, definitely all real and honest, and I'm so glad to have you here. And I actually can't wait to get into have a ton of questions for you, so I hope that you're ready to just keep sharing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, absolutely. That's the only thing to do. I think the listeners out there, they, you know, from my perspective, there's a lot that we all need to know, and you know, as you stated in your introduction there, getting back to the basics and just sharing that time together is very pertinent. Absolutely. And, you know, I was wondering when you answered that question for me the other day, how did that come to be? Like, what was your passion for using the kitchen setting as a reuniting place for family? Um, you know, this whole journey, I, I, was, I was actually a street kid mm -hmm. uh, growing up. I lived on the streets. Um, yeah, look, I was a bit of a mischief maker. The one thing I never really had was that family bonding, you know, and now as a chef, the one thing I see when I go out and do demonstrations is 
you know, the same questions keep popping up. Mum and dad don't know how to not only cook with their children, but they don't know how to really communicate with their children. And so with what I do, I believe food is that common modality that we can all get together in a kitchen and just share our experiences, put the phone down and just learn about each other. Can you give us a visual of like how this whole, because you've done those before, like do you actually educate people on how to actually do that? Or? Uh, yeah, I have. Well, I mean, a quick example on that okay. is I had a, a man and his child. Now I've been doing these demonstrations um, at a business in Footscray in Melbourne, Australia, for probably the last 10 years. Now I've watched families who've, um, you know, the wife was pregnant, She's had a child and his father and his child came through one day and this was only a, a few weeks back. He, his child is now five and he's got, well, what the doctors called an eating disorder because he's not getting the proper nourishment. And his father came along and he said, over the last five years, as this little one's grown up, he only likes to eat your seafood. He only likes to eat what you cook. Whatever we cook, he won't eat. But when he comes here on a weekend, he's eating vegetables. He's eating, you know, fish, fish cakes, fish patties when you cook them. And then I started to really dive a little bit deeper into that to actually understand why. And one of the big things is, is they're telling their kids, saying, you must eat this. And we had... That conversation just led then into, well, what do you normally eat? And then I found out that what they normally eat, now they're Eastern European that have migrated to Australia. So they're used to their flavours. Then as I said to them, I said, well, you have to slowly introduce things, but you've got to do it in a, in a fun way. I said, do you get your son involved in the kitchen? He goes, oh, no, I'd never do that. And that's when the magic starts. I'm sorry, when he was with you then, is that what you did? Is that why he was eating more when you prepared? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, and, you know, and just to chat with the father and, and to say that what I want you to do is start to involve your son in the process of cooking. Mm -hmm. Now, I must admit, he went back to his car three times to only come back and ask more questions. And the great thing was you could start to see that father and son were starting to just look at each other differently because, you know, the child, he's never eaten carrots, celery, parsley, and they're three of the main ingredients in the fish cakes that are served that day. And the son just loved it. And that's what this is all about. And that's why, for me, I've got... I've got a daughter and a son of my own. They love cooking. And, but especially like tomorrow, you know, my daughter and I, we're having a father, father and daughter day. That's and, wonderful. Yeah, and there's no phones. That's the beautiful thing about it. No phones. And so we can share these, these times together because, you know, I, I hear all the time that Kids grow up, so many parents, and especially fathers, they miss the growing up of their children. And I think sometimes we have to slow down and we've got to get back together as that family unit and, you know, learn, enjoy, find out, ask them what their day was, how it was, what did you do? But then also let it turn the other way to where the kids can ask the the parents the questions, even if it's something that was just so hard to answer. But I love doing this through food. Food, I know, in, in our house here, it just, I call it the engine room of any house. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Yep. It's just, you know, it brings back so many memories, even when I was growing up. I mean, it was always family around the table. It was always kitchen, you know, not even so much dining room. It was kitchen, you know, if you have to be even specific about the room, but it definitely, or anything around the table would. 
and just my well, family, well, we're Italian, so, you know, it's been, <laughs> the cooking was just major. And I remember doing things with my grandmother on my mom's side. Um, you know, she made all of her own sauces and just working with the tomatoes and going through that whole process. She made her own jellies and jams and, you know, people don't even think about that stuff today. It's so sad. Everything's so commercialized and fast paced and you're right. It's, it's, we need to spend more time together and that really is such precious time. I have to absolutely agree with you on that. Yeah. And, and I so agree. And, and I think when, you know, coming from that Italian heritage that you have, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the Europeans, they they still do it right because they spend time together. And they oh, I reckon you have some of the best conversations in a kitchen. You have some of the you have you have some of the best screaming matches in a kitchen where not everybody agrees. That is fine. But that's that's what life that's what life's about. When I get together with parents and what we talk about is about planning menus. Mm -hmm. About you know, Get your children to peel the vegetables. Discuss the nutrition. That sometimes what we do is when we peel the vegetables, that nutrition is in that peeling that we've just thrown away. So right. what I like to do, what I like to do, for example, there is I just like to actually, I've got a scouring pad that I just use for food. So instead of peeling a carrot, I actually just rub the rough bits off the carrot, and you're still left with all this nutrition. And Having fun, you know, and I know you, you alluded to this before, there's no right or wrong. That's probably one thing I look at in life. Now, I've been a chef for 30 years. I still believe that I will learn so much more from a 17-year-old a apprentice chef that has just come out of uh, culinary school because he's got the latest lessons. He's got the latest, you know, the latest trends, what's happening in the kitchen. And then so with my experience, I take what he's got and I listen and I learn from him and go, wow, this is amazing. And then I like to keep it simple. Like seafood. Seafood is, it's the simplest protein to cook, but it's a protein that people have so many problems with. Why is that, do you think? Oh, I think people try to do too much. What I see as a chef is, and being a private chef, I go into so many uh, different kitchens and cook for people. People try, because it's such an easy protein, they try to put too many ingredients with it. And when you put too many ingredients with seafood, sometimes you take the flavour away from that protein and you think, well... That's not right. And when you have that happen to you, you turn around, it's almost an association then because it starts to build up to where you go, well, I had Snapper, for example. Now, I think Snapper over in, over in the United States is very similar to uh, a fish called Red Porgy. And the amazing thing about that is that if you build that association that, no, that wasn't nice, I didn't like that, because you did too much. And then a lot of people that I find, they will never cook that again because they had a bad experience. Yep. And that's why I look at it and say, okay, let's just wind it back, keep it simple. You've got a bit of fish, salt and pepper, that's it. Just season it, cook it, try that first. Is it really true when, when, you know, people say if, you know, the fish, <laughs> fresh fish shouldn't smell fishy? Is that true? That's, that is true. It should not smell fishy at all. Okay. What, what you want when you buy your fish, you want it to smell like the sea. So, you know, sometimes if you go walking down to the sea and you've got this, this, the wind comes up and you can smell the ocean and it smells delightful. You got that saltiness. That's what you want with your fish. But then that's when you turn around to your kids because they're right with you, and you say, "What do you smell?" Let them tell you. And by the time you go and do all this, you've had the most amazing bonding sessions with your children to do with seafood, to do with food, to to do with life. Oh, that was beautiful. I could relate to that too. 
Yeah. So are you did you do that with your children? Did you teach them the different the different fish, the different seafood? You know, yeah, and I still a lot of that growing up, I guess, in your cooking. Okay, so for, well to the first first question there, um yes I do sit down with my kids and just we go over flavours. We talk about life. And then I put those life experiences into the kitchen. And it's just so they, they can learn that as well. But then I listen to some of the flavours that they like. And as I say to them, that's okay. Hey, when was the last time you tried that? And they said, well, I haven't yet, Dad. And I said, I want you to try it and tell me exactly what you, how you think that worked. <laughs> because the kids throw out some really um, crazy flavours. And it's you sit back and go, as I say, there's no right or wrong. It's a learning process. But to the, the second part of your question, growing up, I think because I lived on the streets, I had to, and a lot of street kids, they, they have to survive. It's about survival. For me, uh, I joined the Royal Australian Navy when I was 17. And that was probably one of the best things I ever did. It, it made me grow into a man, but it also gave me the confidence in life and to be a chef now and my passion with seafood it's just amazing and, and I, I appreciate everything that has happened in my life to where I am today where did you start the uh, I guess it, well, it's a combination question I guess your love for seafood specifically and what type of schooling then because you said you're a private chef correct so it's not like yeah that's correct Maybe you could explain that to the listeners, by the way, what a private chef is. Okay, so a, a pri private chef, I actually go into people's houses and I cook for them. So I, I've got a set of, um, I've got three sets of menus, uh, which are priced accordingly. And what they do is they'll pick one entree, one main, and one dessert. So it could be a dinner party for four. So I'll actually go into their house and cook for them. So we get to sit down, we get to, once again, have a look at the menu, find out everything about them, because food to me, when I go and do that, it's about theatre in their house as well. So when I actually serve the dinner, I actually tell them where the seafood comes from. So for example, if they have snapper, now our bay here in Melbourne, Melbourne Australia, is called Port Phillip Bay. So I'll serve the fish at the table, for example, snapper. And I just let them know that the snapper, it was caught, say, two days ago. It was caught via long lining, and it is sustainable. That education process, for me, I love doing that because then it tells a story. And the way how I can relate to this is Growing up, I've always been a great storyteller. Always. And to do this via cooking when you're in someone's home, it's, it makes my heart sing because I get to see the different... Um, when, when people talk around the table, the different tonalities because they get excited to just to know where, it, where their foods come from, how it's been caught. And it's just it's such, yeah. such an appreciation too. It's it's perfect. I mean, uh, I think that would it be is. wonderful to, to learn and know that. I mean, I could just in listening to you, not to interrupt you, but just to listen to you, I can hear the type of atmosphere that would exist in that setting. I think that's yeah. wonderful. What a wonderful thing you're doing. Oh, thank thank you so much, Carol. And that's just, but it's a, you know, once again, when I go and do a dinner for four. And just to show you an example of how passionate I am, I'm there for around about four hours. When I walk out of there, it feels like I've been there for 10 minutes. Wow, that's wonderful. <clears throat> that kind of tells you you're very passionate and enjoy your work. It's not even work. Uh, no, that's right. It's not and it, even it's, work. <laughs> no, it, you know, you're just interacting with, with wonderful people, discussing you know, they're sitting around a table discussing life and, and everything. And, you know, my last um, 
dinner that I did, I actually even gave the, the birthday boy himself a clean class on doing a lobster bisque. These are the fundamentals of life, from my own opinion, because food brings us all together. And I do believe that kids are our future moving forward. And there are a lot of kids that go to school, for example, that don't eat correctly before they go to school. And this is one thing that's very, very close to my heart is just making sure that, you know, we do things right for our kids. I, once again, these are my own opinions because it's not about me, it's about my kids. Making sure they eat right, making sure that you're a parent. That's your job. Your job is a parent because my kids are going to grow up to be absolutely wonderful adults. Yes, I am biased, but I also know that in our family unit, we've got something that is so strong and it's listening. And I think that's, that, that could be the key word for the day is listening. And it's just listening to your kids, listening to how their day has gone. Put that into action with food. Get them to, you know, peel those carrots or scrub the carrots. Get them to, you know, teach them how to use a knife in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. You know, listening to you, I'm thinking, do you realize how rote normally preparation of meals are, um, even for people that, that may like or enjoy cooking. I think that, you know, like for one, I, I used to watch the, the food channels because I just like cooking. You know, and I was in the industry for a while, and I did have a restaurant and, and probably 20 years ago, but, and I love it, so it was something from the gardening and the concept and the, just, it's like when I think of Italy, although I've never been there, I think of all that, because we don't really have we have some places like that in the States, but not many, of just all of the, the markets that are out in the open and just those fresh vegetables, and, you know, and all that stuff. But I'm thinking, I've watched a lot of people that just don't even think about what they're putting on the plate. They don't, like, okay, well, I went shopping and I did, and we're having this menu. But when listening to you talk, I'm thinking, people don't really think, like, where did that seafood come from? You know, or what exactly am I preparing and what's the history behind it or anything? You know, what's the nutritional value of it? It's sad because it's just, a, it's like a rote action that's just done and there it is, you know. So, and speaking of stories, I think that stories in life and business and families are just, I mean, it's a necessity, I think. I really do. I, I agree. Oh, yeah, it's just, it makes such a difference really listening to people. And I, and I am a firm believer about that also, good communication and also listening. I think it's so important because it's really interacting and really getting to the heart and soul of another human being. And I know for a legacy for myself, I've always, I've, I just want to make sure that people, anything that can help people treat each other better or pe- treat animals even better is really what I, you know, just, and passionate about because I think our world is so love and touch deprived and it's education is lacking and it's and it's whether it's done through stories or just caring about another human being it's it's what's really important in life I know I so yeah it is very refreshing just listening to you because I think that so many of the aspects that make that a beautiful way of life I'm hearing you describe and it, it's so it's so interesting and you know as a little bit of a segue here, I have a um, a mentor that I I guess we've known each other since uh, 2011 or something, and it's it's interesting what we're talking about because he was you know we we all belong to a certain membership group and and he was talking that his his actually she's 17 his 17 year old daughter asked him if he would come home because he was traveling across the states actually something that he wanted to do after you know having a successful business and 
um, he literally sold his house, got into Winnebago, and just, you know, because he used to also um, fix cars and stuff. So, you know, he got a used Winnebago. He's just been traveling with he and himself and his dog and his mother because she's uh, losing her sight and stuff, and he wanted to get her to see more sights in the world and stuff and also spend time with her. Well, his daughter called and asked him if she if he could come back home to Kansas for a while. And listening to him, he was putting you know messages to us back and forth in Skype, talking about she's his world and that when she needs something, he's there. And that's why he has worked his in his life in order to be able to have the lifestyle now to be able to go back to be sure that she's okay before she heads off to college. And that he's taught her so much about his own business so that she will never want for a job. I mean, just listening, and I'm thinking, listening to him in such heartfelt conversation about his, ch- his child, because his children actually has another daughter, um, and listening to you talk, those are so, it's like it just touches your heart, because that's what's so vital in today's world, and it, the sad thing is you don't hear that from many people. No, that's exactly right, and this is, what, this is why, especially when I do my demonstrations, and and I've got a lot of families, and I have, have a lot of young kids. Mum and Dad will go into the fishmonger, and they'll stay outside while I'm doing you know, some sampling demonstrations on the barbecue with seafood. And, I, and I've had so many kids who will eat this seafood, and they've never touched fish in their life. Mm-hmm. That is because it's, I have fun with them. And I think sometimes, you know, as, as parents... Yeah, you know what, if you have a bad day, have a bad day. That's cool. But you know what? I do believe in one thing that you, when you're with your children especially, at a young age, they take everything in. You know, you, you are that figure to where they will go, well, you know, mum and dad, they, they, they have so much fun in the kitchen. You know, whenever we sit around for dinner, they are really, really cool. And we can talk about anything. That is ideal. Mm -hmm. But does that happen all the time? No. You know, all it takes is that wrong. It just, I think I just really get, I do get passionate about it because I do see it all the time. And I see it from, from parents who don't have that right communication with their own kids. I mean, I, an example, there was a young kid, I reckon he would have been about four or five. Dad had gone into the fish shop to buy his fish. This little boy was sitting, standing outside and we're chatting. Dad said he doesn't eat fish. I said, that's cool. By the time Dad got out, this little boy had polished off about a fillet, you know, probably about a 160 gram fillet of fish. I'm sitting going, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. Well, some things you do in life and you think, oh, no. Well, then, Dad's come out. He's seen this. And, you know, he said, thank you very much. He, something wasn't right. He dragged this kid across the road by his arm and started yelling at him. Oh, my word. That broke my heart. And I thought, well, now, would I ever change it? No. And I don't. But then what that says to me, and I, and I felt sad because this young child who's at that imprint stage, you know, what, what I see is that he's going to grow up and he's going to say to his children, oh, no, no, you don't eat that. Mm-hmm. You know, he's copying his own father. And I think with, uh, with fathers, in this day and age, especially, there's a lot of fathers who uh, are no longer married. They're paying child support. They get to spend those Saturdays with their with their kids. And you know what? You, know, you can make life easy if you want to. It's a decision. Or you can make it hard. The one thing in life, uh, my kids, I'm separated. Uh, I've remarried. And, but the one thing in my life is I keep life easy. I'm passionate about life. And when you keep it easy and just go with the flow, 
and laugh with people. I, I, my, my ex-wife and I, we still laugh together. The kids are great. She is the best mother on this planet for those kids. But it's how you treat your own life. And in a kitchen, it works perfectly. Because you can get all messy. <laughs> As long as as long as you as long as you know how to clean properly, <laughs> it, can, it can get messy, but a lot of fun. And you've got to laugh. You've got to laugh. You know, I, I wake up every day and I, I go through one particular routine where I, I go through a whole hour of appreciation every day. And as part of that appreciation, and that's for me, that's for my, my wife, my kids, even our own little puppy dog. And just learn to appreciate everyone that crosses my path in that day to, to where I just appreciate Mother Nature for a, such a beautiful day. And that beautiful day, if it's raining, it's still beautiful. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just, yeah, that's why I'm very so passionate about life. I'm so passionate about what I do with seafood and especially passionate about kids because... You know, if you sit back in the kitchen, you laugh, have fun, learn from them, they'll learn from you. I tell you what, they're going to grow up to be beautiful, absolutely beautiful. We need more of that. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of laughter, that's also very important, and it also brings back to mind what we were talking about, about no rights and wrongs, because one of the best things is not to be judged. Like, let's say, for example... You, had, you were showing somebody how to cut an onion, or chop an onion, I should say, and they don't yep. do it right. Well, even if they don't do it right, at least they're not being scolded. And that's, that's another problem with a lot of, even when, when certain families <clears throat> attempt to do something together, then it's like, well, you're not doing that right, or you didn't listen, you know what I mean? So that was one of the, the nicest things that I heard in your answer to me the other day, too, about there not being rights and wrongs in that kitchen setting. Because that defeats the whole purpose. Of course it does. Yep. And talking about laughing, I was wondering, do do you have a specific, like a funny incident that you remember with either something in the kitchen when you were at someone's home or during one of your shows or? Oh, look, well, I mean, okay, well, a funny incident. I, look, this is funny to me. It's probably not funny to a lot of people. Um, but we, we, we were actually filming on the Australian Seafood Show uh-huh. in a place called T- Tin Can Bay in Queensland. And there's this beautiful island off, off um, Brisbane called Fraser Island. Now, when we're at Tin Can Bay filming, and everyone would know uh, what a drone is. It's, it's basically our producer. He's got a, a camera. And it just, it's like on a helicopter that flies remote control up in the air. And he had that going. And he said to Con and myself, he goes, boys, I want you to go out and pretend you're fishing. And I was like, okay. So we actually put some lures on. We walked out and we started fishing. And we got a bit deeper and deeper, probably up to our waistlines. Now, then all of a sudden, all these people started screaming. And we're thinking, what's going on? You know, and they're going, do you realise where you are? And I said, yeah, Tin Can Bay. And they said, we've had lots of rain overnight. Yeah. And this is notoriously busy for bull sharks. <laughs> so, uh, the two of us, were, we was like walking on water to get out of there. <laughs> oh, it worked all right. But, um, it, you know, that was one of those, those funny times. I mean... Gee, oh, even another funny time, I was when in that same shoot when we were up in Queensland, hopping out, out of the boat. I actually split my pants. <laughs> now, when, you, when, when, yeah, when, you, when, when they're filming, and it's just like, you, you just have to stay focused. Are they live? Yes. No, they're not live. They're all, oh, okay. they're all recorded. <laughs> but our... Yeah, but I must admit, our producer, Charlie, he likes to keep a lot of funny things in there. Uh-huh. And, um, but that particular show, uh, I haven't seen it yet. Oh. And they, there's, a, there's a couple of things. But I mean, this, this is uh, season two is just airing on Foxtel now as we speak. Okay. But the amazing thing about it is 
by the time we finished that particular shoot, because we were up there for, um, for a few days, and he said, Pete, I reckon you said beautiful about a hundred times. And I said, that is absolutely beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but oh, that's, well, you know, we're feeling it, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when it comes to doing the, pri the private dinners, I had, I was down doing a private dinner in Alwood. It's one of the beachside suburbs in Melbourne. And there was a lady from, um, from California. Um, she's, you know, very much into spirituality and she was doing a, a, a conference here. And she was there with a few of her friends and I was cooking the dinner. Now, I've cooked this entree and I've like, put it all down on the table and it just all turned around and looked at me and I said, hi guys. <laughs> I said, well, is everything okay? And they said, well, we're not eating. And have you, is there a fish for you? And I said, no. And they said, well, I think you should get some for yourself and come and sit down because we, we're not going to start eating until you're at the table with us. <laughs> and that, and that, was, that was truly beautiful because... Yeah, that was nice. Yeah, it was just lovely. And these are all the times that I really appreciate. But then, you know, there's the other times and, you know, I suppose my sense of humour. I always like to make sure I have fun. I'm very positive. I've gone through so many of the negative things in life and it's as like, you know, come out the other side. I like to be present. And when I, when I say present, it's just like, I'm chatting to you right now, Carol. That's all that matters to me. Nothing else exists around in my hemisphere right now except chatting to you. That is one of the key fundamental life experiences that, that I've really listened to, read books, and just got to that stage now to where, you know, to be happy is to be present. In the moment, yep. Absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. And, you know, you imagine doing that with your kids. I, did a, I actually did a dinner party um, last week. And it was just out, it was about a 50 minute drive from where we live. And the father, very, very busy man. He turns businesses around. And so he's always flying and he's got a three and a half year old. I've walked in the door and the three and a half year old turns around to dad and goes, I like him. So when I, I got the okay from the three and a half year old, which I think is just beautiful. <laughs> And, and then, you know, the way dad interacted with that, with his son, wow, that was off the charts. That was amazing. And it was so good to see. And then, you know, I've said to mum and dad, I said, well, now, what's Michael going to eat? And they've turned around and said, well, we want him to have what we're having. I said, okay. Challenge accepted. Now, a three and a half year old, he had uh, sashimi with um, caviar. Wow. He had some cook, cooked yellowtail kingfish. And he had kelp noodles with wakame seaweed that had been rehydrated. Oh, and don't forget the edible flowers as a garnish. Uh -huh. He ate the whole thing, <laughs> ate everything. And then mum turns around, yeah, I know. And then mum turns around to me and she goes, I don't like you anymore. <laughs> I said, why? She goes, my son loves caviar. Oh, no. And I, and, and I thought, oh, well, that's life. So my, <laughs> yeah, my little gift to the boy is, and I called Michael over and he came over and I gave him this jar of caviar that I had left and it was about three quarts of the jar. And I said, look, that's your little present from me. And I said, so in your lunch, you can have some caviar. I said, just don't tell people what it is. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> that was uh, wonderful of you, though. Oh, that's a nice yeah, story. <laughs> yeah, but, and these are all the different experiences. Being a private chef that I get to see, you know, whether I'm filming on the Australian Seafood Show, you know, whether I'm in someone's house as a private chef, 
the experiences are what I perceive them to be. And that's what I'd say to all the listeners. You know what, taking all the experiences you want in life, there, there are lessons that we learn, but then have fun, laugh about them. And, you know, never forget them, but once it's done, it's done. Move on to the next thing. Because I do believe, and, and the kids will start to see this, when kids start to see parents having fun, when kids start to see, you know, laughter, what fills their heart, they go to school the next day and go, wow, life's great. Let's go and play, you know, let's get off our phones. Oh, and then they have stories to tell then too, because they enjoy yeah. themselves. So, yep. Exactly, and... That's once again, and, and that's what it's like. I mean, we can go and do a, a TV shootout out in the middle of the ocean, which we did on a, on a tuna show. And when people see that, and, and my daughter turned around and said, Dad, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. As I said to her, I said, that is so much fun. And then, then you get to tell the story of how the tuna is brought into the ship by spraying the water with the seawater so it acts like little pilchards or sardines and so they come to feed and you've got these two guys on this one big who've got these uh, two like big fishing rods each and both lines come together to make one because these tuna can be up to 150 kilo wow and so they spray in the water the tuna come in they grab it and then they they bring in the tuna and then they the way they the way they actually, well, once your tuna's in board, yep, they have to process the fish and they do it very sustainably and very quickly. And when I tell my kids, when I told my daughter that story, she's just gone, wow, that's amazing. These are, you know, and that's life, Carol. That is life. Absolutely. I can tell you have an appreciation from what's in the sea too. Literally. Uh, I, was, yeah, I do. Yeah, a massive appreciation. And, you know, as I said, I, I joined the Royal Australian Navy when I was 17. And I became a chef on board a Navy ship. I did my, um, did my cooking course in the Navy. And from there... My appreciation came all in the South China Sea and the water was like glass. It's like you're sailing on glass. Way over in the distance, there was a rain squall coming. And it was like, wow, this is the most magical sight. But then all of a sudden, what, out of the water comes flying out this killer whale. Oh, my word. And I've just gone, wow, that is amazing. And he went back down. This rain squall came across, and you could just see the, the rain hitting the water. And also, so that was a totally amazing experience. And so that was one of the experiences. But the other one was there's a fish called a sunfish in the Southern Ocean, between, uh, especially between Australia and New Zealand. The sunfish, they're massive. I don't know if you've ever seen one. They're like a big flounder. But when I say big, they can be like two meters in circumference, so even more. Even more. They are they are very big fish. And but to see see this big this big disc just floating on top of the water, and you think, what is that? And then it's not till a few years later that you learn out it's a sunfish. And you, you just get to have an appreciation for what's out there. It's a shame that over the years we're, we're destroying a little bit more of what's out there, but I'm, I'm, there it is. Just nature is wonderful in and of itself. You know, I'm wondering too, I was going to ask you about your education, but you just explained that. So do you, what made you decide to be a private chef? as opposed to just the, just the 
connection with the people as opposed to like having a restaurant and doing that type of a thing? Um, see, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough question because I think I just, I started off in restaurants mm-hmm. uh, when I got out of the Navy. And then what I think what did it for me was I was working at, at a, a members club and I was looking after all the bistro and all of the room service. And I think after, after, after a time there, I, it made me realize that one, the hours were really long. Chefs, they don't get treated the best. And, and I'm talking about from the public. And the other point was, that was fascinating was that from a monetary perspective as well, and I, I sat there and went, you know what, there's more to life than just coming to, a, coming to a kitchen and working every day. And then if one of my chefs were sick, I quite often had to do double shifts. And you think there's more to this. There's more to it. And so I went into the sales in food industry for a while. And then just the private chefing, just, it just started out of nowhere. And it's just like, and I, I'll never, ever, ever, look at anything different now, but to go into people's houses and cook for them, it's perfect because you do get to connect with people in their own house that are more relaxed. One, if they've got kids, they don't have to worry about a babysitter. They don't have to worry about getting a taxi and you know having too much to drink. And they can sit back. And nine times out of ten, where does everybody congregate? in the kitchen and we all just have a laugh, we talk about life, we talk about seafood. That is pivotal. And I've had some of the most amazing children just ask questions and we, they get feedback, I get feedback. It's just, it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. That's a perfect word, and I can tell it suits you unbelievably. <laughs> it really, really just... And you know, it's sad when you said that people don't... If you used the word respect, or they, oh, they didn't treat chefs well. That's really, yeah. like, hard for me. You know, I maybe mean, just because I was in that industry for a while, but you know people talk about doctors or that they just have a... Res- well, <laughs> people used to have more respect for them than maybe they do now, but it's just a respected field, to use it as an example. That's how I feel about chefs, personally. I mean, to me, I've, I used to love, like, being in the kit, you know, because I was normally in management, or I started out, like, college, whether it was receptionist or whatever, but then over the years, I moved up, and it seemed like I always got into management quickly. And then I actually owned my own restaurant and stuff for a while in a catering company. But to watch the chefs, they taught me so much. It was just... I just I could sit and talk to a chef forever. <laughs> some of the techniques I remember the first time somebody showed truthfully here I go with the onion again. But the, how to really truthfully cut chop an onion and it was just like so quick. I think how the heck did they used to do? When I first learned that, I mean just some of the techniques and it. I did the same thing with um, watching, particularly my mother, one of my sisters in particular, and my mother's mom. I just. I I remember my grandmother used to, because back in the day here, there were actually what we would call like the fruit man, (laughs) or the vegetables. Hmm. They used to actually come to the door. Okay, didn't you didn't have to go out and shop? They actually once a week would come to the door. I remember her like having these onions and like peppers and tomatoes, and she'd lean over the kitchen sink, and she would just like bite right into them. And I'm think I think that's when I learned all of that. You talk about flavors and about the stories behind it and appreciation for it. I mean, I saw that in living people through my grandparents and my mother. It just, that's why I think I I just, I just, I just, I love gardening. I love to cook. So when I'm listening to you talk, I really feel that like on a heart level. And I, and I am just so grateful that whatever and however that we connected to actually share this time together and to be able to discuss this and I'm so happy that it's going to be global now that people can hear your story and your passion it, it just just thank you so much for existing <laughs> oh, Carol, thank you
Oh, absolutely. Th- absolutely. Thank you so much. It, it's it's been a it's been an honour, and you know appreciation is an understatement, because you know in, in my world as a private chef, and the one thing that means a lot to me is obviously you know bringing people together and it's putting the phone down get together whether it be a barbecue in the backyard leave your phones at the front door you know and just enjoy each other because we're not doing that enough I, I agree and you know it, I can't believe that, that we've actually been talking for as long as we have when I hate to hang up but this is what I want to ask first of all yep. <clears throat> Please share with everybody what is the best way. I mean, can anybody watch your show, first of all, before I go on to ask you about your contact information? Is it is it possible to see anything on YouTube or is the show yes. live? Would it be live here in the States at all or anything? Uh, okay, the show's not live in the States, but it is on it is on YouTube. Oh, so, yeah, so if you were to type in the Australian Seafood Show, okay. you, can, you can actually, uh, we've got our website up. So www.theaustralianseafoodshow.com and you can actually go and uh, have a look and we've got all of season one on there and it's very it's very educational from a seafood perspective in Australia. That's perfect. But yeah, very educational and it's it's a great show. And so season two will be up online probably in the next in the next few months. So we're going to wait until um, season two finishes on Foxtel, and then we shall put all that up on the uh, website then. Okay, and then share with everybody if you like your website or emails or whatever you want to share. As far as uh, yes. Okay, so from my perspective, my website is www.petehilkey.com. Um, if you do, do want to, sorry. Can you spell that for people, please? Ah, uh, yes. So it's P E T E H I L C K E dot com. Okay. And if anybody does want to send me an email, you can send an email to info at petehilkey dot com. So P E T E H I L C K E dot com. And any social? Okay, social media. Uh, on Facebook, Private Chef Pete Hilke. Once again, H I L C K E. Okay. Okay, and is there, well, I know for myself, I could go on talking for forever with you, but is there anything in particular on the subject that, that we came together to discuss today that you'd like to add that maybe we haven't covered? You know, I, I think we've covered everything, Carol. You know, I just want everyone probably to slow down in life. Think about what they're going to say. Learn from each other and laugh. Have fun. And don't take it too seriously. That's it. That's beautiful. Well, I want to thank you so very, very much. Maybe you'll come back and join us again. Oh, I would be honored to. Okay, you make it, I believe it's daytime there. You make it a great day. <laughs> yeah, and you have a lovely evening. Okay, thank you. And now all the listeners, here's what makes your heart happy and your soul smile. Take care. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.